Hey guys, it's Mariana, and today we're talking about Game of Thrones Season 5, Episode 2, The House of Black and White. So this has been a pretty eventful episode. It honestly felt like it just flew by. I was talking to my friend and we were both saying how this didn't even feel like a full length episode because we were so into it and obviously really, really enjoyed it. We've caught up with some characters that we didn't see in episode one and some pretty interesting stuff went down. So first of all, we finally got to see Arya at Bravos, and she is arriving there. She's ready to learn to be one of the faceless men. And let me tell you, Bravos looks absolutely beautiful. We have seen the giant before, and he looks cool every time you look at him. But then the city itself really reminded me of Venice, and I'm really curious where they shot this because it really does have that city on the water feel and Arya is taken straight to the house of black and white and she's ready to go she's ready for her story to begin she knocks on the door and this guy answers the door she's never seen him she says Valar Morghulis she gives him the coin and she says Jack and Hagar gave this to me and the guy's just kind of like and go somewhere else and she says I have nowhere else to go and she, he's like no you have everywhere else to go and just shuts the door in her face and poor Arya doesn't know what to do again she just kind of hangs out there and then throws her coin into the water and leaves. Later we see Arya back where the streets of Bravos are which I'm really curious how she got back there because from the way it was shot, it looked like the House of Black and White is like its own little island in the water. And I really want to know how she get, just got back to the city. It's really curious. But anyway, she's trying to score some food. She killed a pigeon and then she gets ambushed by these thug guys who want to kill her, take her food, whatever. I don't even know what they want. But then they quickly scurry off because somebody shows up behind her. She turns around. It's the same guy that she met at House of Black and White. And she follows him back. And she's like, who are you? What is your deal? And he turns around and he changes his face. And I actually kind of screamed because I was so excited to see Jack and Hagar back. I have been wanting this guy to come back since season two and I have been waiting for this to happen and it was my hope that he would show up um, in Bravos when Arya finally got to Bravos and he's there and now he's going to teach her how to be a faceless man. I'm so excited to see where Arya's storyline goes now and I really hope that there's a lot of Jack and involved in this season because I just love watching him talk. He says the weirdest things and he's so intriguing and I want to see what the whole changing faces thing is all about. And I kind of have this theory that maybe Jack and Hagar and Syria Pharrell are the same person because we never saw Syria Pharrell die in season one. And they're both from Bravos, so who knows? Maybe they are both the faceless men. We also get to see Brienne and Pod as well as Sansa and Baelish. And what a coincidence, they are eating in the same inn. I don't know about that. It was just so convenient that they happen to be at the same place. But anyways, they're in the same inn having a snack and Pod sees Sansa and he tells Brienne and Brienne's like, okay, you ready the horses? I'm going over there and she goes over to where Sansa is and she tries to kind of pledge herself to Sansa because she was Catelyn's sworn sword and now she wants to protect her children and Lord Baelish makes her look kind of like an idiot because he's like, hey, didn't you used to be Renly Baratheon's sworn sword and then Catelyn's and now both of them are dead so clearly you're not doing your job too well and Sansa doesn't seem like she wants anything to do with Brienne anyways so she tells her to leave but at the same time Peter Baelish is like hold on a second don't leave it might be dangerous outside but really what he means is that you now know that Sansa is with me and we can't allow this information to get out because Sansa is kind of undercover as Elaine Stone. And of course, Brienne catches on to that. So she kind of gets in the fight with the soldiers who are protecting Baelish and Sansa. And of course, Brienne is a badass. So she kicks everybody's butt and her and Podrick are able to get away. And then Podrick thinks they're just going to go somewhere else and live out their own lives. But 
Brienne is not sulking anymore. She found Sansa and she's back on her mission to protect the Stark girls. She just won't let it go and Pod is kind of like, hey, you know, they don't want your protection so maybe you are released from your vows at this point. And she's like, no, she's not safe with Peter Baelish. We're going to follow them. What I'm really curious about is if everybody is going to end up at Winterfell by the end of the season because I'm pretty sure that Baelish and Sansa are heading to Winterfell because in the trailer we see Sansa at what looks like Winterfell and then the Boltons are at Winterfell and now if Brienne and Pod are following Sansa then they are going to Winterfell. So I feel like this might get pretty crazy as the show goes on and I wonder if Brienne is going to end up kind of compromising and working with Peter Baelish because that's the only way she can protect Sansa obviously because Sansa is not going to just leave Peter on his own or if she's just going to silently follow her and wait until there's a moment where she can protect her. Of course we also got to see what's going on at King's Landing and there's actually a lot of stuff that has to do with King's Landing in this episode. First of all, Cersei is pissed off because she was sent this necklace and she thinks this is a threat from Dorne where her daughter Marcella is and Jaime comes in and she is obviously distraught and pissed off and just yelling and going crazy and Jamie's like, she need to keep it down because you keep yelling that this is our daughter and we're not in the best of relationships as far as public opinion goes. So we need to not yell about this. And after that little interaction, Jamie decides he's going to go to Dorne and try to bring Princess Marcella back. Now, I have a little bit of a question to this scene and I want to know if you guys have noticed this, but the whole reason that um, Cersei thinks this is a threat about Marcella is because what she has been sent is this necklace, which is like a Lannister necklace. And she says there are only two necklaces like this in this whole world, and it's the one that she wears and the one she gave Marcella. Well, the thing is, there actually are three necklaces like this, because if you remember in season one, after this whole thing with Joffrey and Sansa and Arya, where they got into a fight and then one of the direwolves got killed, Joffrey went to make up with Sansa because she thought he was mad at her and he gave her the same necklace that his mother wears as a gift and Sansa even said oh it's the same one that your mother has and she is seen later wearing this necklace so there's definitely three of them and there's no way that Cersei didn't see it because she was wearing it left and right in King's Landing. Like she would have noticed this. So my question is, is Cersei being the manipulative bitch like she normally is? Or is this a threat from somebody else that Peter Baelish maybe sent this necklace? Because if you remember, Peter Baelish was reading some Raven scroll that he received and Sansa was like, what is that? And he's like, ah, don't worry about it. So maybe this has something to do with something completely different and he's just trying to push her buttons. But then why would she tell Jamie that there are only two when there are clearly three necklaces? Basically, this is probably way more complicated than what it looks like because I really doubt the creators of the show would miss such a detail and just sweep it under the rug. Really doubt that. Anyways, Jamie goes to recruit Bronn to go with him to Dorne and Bronn is all set with his future wife and his future castle and he's ready to settle down and Jamie shows up and he's like, no, you're going to help me and we're going to go do something and when we come back I'm going to give you a better wife and a better castle. We do end up seeing a short scene set in Dorne where Ilaria Sand is clearly still upset about what happened to Oberyn as all of us are and she kind of wants to take it out on Marcella so this is where the necklace thing may seem legit as a threat, but I don't know. I feel like it's more complicated. She goes to Doran, who is Oberyn's older brother, and she's like, you need to send a message. You need to go to war with these people. They killed your brother. And Doran is like, um, well, he died in 
trial by combat so it's not like they assassinated him it's, I'm not gonna go to war over this so at this point it seems like Ilaria is probably going to go rogue with the sand snakes and try to avenge Oberyn on her own without Doran's support and it's really interesting to see how he's going to react to this because his brother did die but he's trying to keep it together and not go to war to King's Landing because he doesn't really have a reason but if she starts doing stuff. I wonder if he's going to end up joining her. We also got a quick glimpse at Tyrion and Varys who are on their way to Volantis in order to be on the way to Marine. and Tyrion is back to drinking and sulking because he is still not sure why he's doing what he's doing and why can't he be left alone and I was a little bit annoyed by that scene. It, it, it had some humor, it was funny, and Varys is trying to still convince him that he still has a part to play in the fate of the Seven Kingdoms, but you can see Varys is getting tired of this, and I am getting tired with Varys because Tyrion really needs to get his stuff together. After that, we go back to King's Landing, where Cersei is trying to hold on to any kind of power that she can. Now she is at the small council meeting, she's sitting where the hand of the king sits and she is trying to hand people new jobs because she's trying to be in charge. She says she is acting on behalf of Tommen and that he's learning how to rule and really we all know that she just wants to feel powerful and nobody really opposes her too much except for Uncle Kevin. She tries to assign him as the master of war and he says, you know, that's all great, but I would like to hear it from the king himself. And she's like, well, he's not here, so you're hearing it from me. And he says, well, if he needs me, I will be at Casterly Rock because you don't have the authority to tell me anything and I'm not your puppet. And that was kind of satisfying to see in a way because I was getting tired of Cersei just telling people what to do and getting away with stuff. And finally, somebody put her in her place. So I am wondering if that is like the beginning of the end for her character. We also get to see what's going on at Marine, where Dario and a few Unsullied are trying to find Sons of the Harpy and trying to see what's going on with that and they find one of the Sons of the Harpy and Daenerys is trying to decide what to do with this guy because some people are suggesting to kill him, some people are suggesting to not kill him. She says, you know, killing him would send the message and Sir Barristan and Selmy is like, no, you can't do this. You need to give this man a fair trial. You're here to rule. You're not a murderer. Finally, after everybody else leaves, Sir Barristan does convince Daenerys to give this guy a fair trial because he reminds her of what happened to her father, the Mad King, and how he felt justified for all of the murders that he committed and that just didn't work out so well for him. But not everything goes according to plan because why would it? It's Game of Thrones and one of the members of the council, I don't know if this is her official council, but one of the people who advises her is a former slave and he pretty much is of an opinion that these people do not understand fair trial. What they understand is blood. So he decides to disobey Daenerys and kill the son of the harpy. After that, he's brought in front of her and she says, you know, his life was not yours to take. So we're going to make an example out of you because law is law. And then after that, she makes probably the worst decision that she could have made in this situation because she decides that she needs to publicly sentence him to death and then execute him in front of everybody in the city who will come and watch. And I don't know where and at what point did that sound like a great idea to her because she didn't have the support of the masters really because she took away their slaves and they're kind of forced to do their own thing now. So they weren't really on her side all that much. And then she had the support of the former slaves because she liberated them. And then she executed this guy in front of them as they were asking for mercy and they are now pissed off as well. So I don't even know who supports her at Marine right now except for the Unsullied. So this is not going to work out for Daenerys and she kind of has to scurry off back into her pyramid because the crowd turns violent and it is not a good situation. Later on she wants to be left alone. She goes out on the terrace 
and she sees Drogon who has come to visit her. How sweet. It is a really interesting moment actually because her and Drogon kind of have this mother-child moment and you can see in her face that there's hope there that she can get this under control because her dragon has come back to her and now she can get her other two dragons under control and fix everything and she's still the mother of dragons but a few seconds later Drogon just takes off and flies away and she kind of looks like her hope just flew away with that as well. Finally, last but not least, we have all of the stuff that happens at the wall. And first thing that we see is Shireen, Stannis' daughter, teaching Gilly how to read. And it's kind of a funny interaction in the library while we get the sense that Sam was kind of a little bit harsh on Gilly trying to teach her how to read and telling her she needs to practice all day long and she's like well Shireen's a good teacher unlike some people without patience. But then Shireen's mother Lady Solis came in and that lady doesn't like anybody so she was like all of you get out and she says you cannot talk to the wildling girl because your father executed their king, he captured the wildlings and they're not nice people and they may try to do something through you and Shireen is just kind of like, she's not like that. She likes me. I like Gilly and we're friends. And Lady Sleaze is like, you, despite reading all these books, you still don't know what people do. And then we also have Stannis who is annoyed with Jon because Jon showed mercy to Mance Raider and that whole thing. And Jon just kind of tells him how it is because um, the wildlings aren't going to follow Stannis and the North is loyal to the Starks and Stannis just received a reply that pretty much said that as well. And so Stannis has this new plan and he says, you know what, if you're going to kneel to me, because this is all he does in the show, Stannis wants people to kneel to him, it's kind of comical at this point, but he says, if you kneel to me, I will make you Jon Stark and you will be Lord of Winterfell. And that is kind of all that John ever wanted in life. He wanted his father to um, accept him as his son and make him a Stark. And so John kind of has some stuff to consider, but he says later to Sam that, you know, even though this is all I ever wanted, I took a vow and I'm a man of the Night's Watch and I'm going to refuse this. At the same time, the Night's Watch has to elect a new Lord Commander and everybody's pretty much convinced that it's going to be Alistair Thorne because he is the most obvious choice for the job. There's also another candidate who's this old guy, apparently important, but not too many people care about him. And then in the last moment before the voting begins, Sam steps up and he's like, hey, we got Jon Snow over here, I nominate him. And Jon just gives him a look of, don't you dare, and Sam does it anyways. He says, you know, this guy is the reason we're all still here. He saved us when um, Sir Alistair was wounded. He went beyond the wall to talk to Mance Raider. He has proven himself time after time and you guys need to vote for him. And long story short, I was feeling like Jon Snow was going to get elected and then they kind of got me nervous there because there was a tie and I'm assuming the tie was between Alistair and Jon Snow and at that moment Maester Aemon had to make a choice and break the tie and he voted for Jon and now Jon is Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. I'm so excited for this. Overall, I am pretty impressed with how this season is going so far. Granted, there's only been two episodes, but the first episode was a really strong setup for storylines and we're kind of checking back in with people. And then the second episode had a bit more setup with the people that we haven't seen, but at the same time, it had some really interesting developments happen and I just cannot wait to see where all of this goes. So that's it for my episode recap and review of the House of Black and White. As you can tell I am unbelievably excited because I am still not over the fact that Jack and Hagar is back. Can we all just take a moment? 
I hope you guys enjoyed this recap. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and also subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so. I will be talking about episode 3 next week and it looks like it's going to be an exciting one as well judging by the preview. I hope you guys are having an amazing day and I will see you soon in my next video. Bye!